Hi, my name's Dave Adams. Welcome to The Core Mechanic. This week, I wanted to do a bit of a special Core Mechanic. It's our last one for the season. It's a bit of a double episode feature sort of thing. So I'm putting two talks together. Now, I initially de delivered this talk at the Oz Comic Con and it went really well, actually. I was really pleased with it. Um, it we, we were talking about video and board game design and how they can inform each other. And it came directly out of uh, Mike Selinker's uh, list, not in terms of the games necessarily, but in terms of the content that uh, he, on his list, in Mike Selinker's list, it actually has a lot of video games and board games. And we've been looking at the board game side of things, but that's not to say that video games don't have an important part or an important voice within the game design community or the game design, sorry, or the gaming community. Uh, specifically, I wanted to look at uh, mostly how design choices are made in terms of motivating us to play the game and teaching us how to play the game. There's risks, rewards, there's those sorts of things. But I've, I've sort of come across an idea in terms of human psychology that I want to explore a little bit as we go through this and hopefully help us to understand as designers how we can utilize some of these for our own design, as well as being aware perhaps of some of the moral and ethical issues involved in game design. We're going to get to some more of that a little bit later. The reason I'm refilming this instead of just showing you the original talk that I did at Oz Comic Con was a couple of reasons, but one of them is that it was the first time that I did it and I had to work in front of what was some um, uh, limitations in terms of sound, lighting, all that sort of thing. But also it was hard because of the distance between myself and the, the, the laptop, it was hard to get slide changes happening. So there's lots of pause and breaks as we try and wait for slides to come up. Uh, what I'll do is I'll film that separately here and just make it part of the, the actual film. The other reason is also I was actually approached rather interestingly by uh, this wonderful young lady after the talk who came to question and challenge some of the things that I had to say. Not because uh, she wanted to just attack me over anything specific and at no point did I feel like I was being attacked, but in a very academic intellectual way raised, uh, challenged me on some of the, the thinking or at least some of the things that I presented. Um, it turned out that she was in fact a child psychiatrist uh, dealing with or specifically focusing on uh, adolescent development and the impact of video games. What that meant for me was that there was some areas that she highlighted that I thought I could probably even explain a little bit more clearly. One specifically being that she she thought maybe that I was that I hated video games and I didn't want to give that impression at all. So I want to try and work towards getting this talk right so that in case I get the chance to do it with others, but also trying to present an honest approach to what I feel are uh, really big issues in terms of game design. With that said, we'll get into it and try and have a look at some of the issues of game design. Now, I had a friend who really loved eggs and this person would eat an egg every day if they could. They, they quite happily enjoyed eggs, but there was one day in which they ate their egg or ate quite a few eggs and then were incredibly sick afterwards. In fact, they were very, very sick afterwards. And what happened is that experience of being sick combined with the stimulus of the egg led to a new stimulus or a new experience of eggs. Instead of eggs being something that they enjoyed, eggs were now something that they couldn't stomach or couldn't handle without feeling sick. Now what this led to was a pairing of its stimulus. So uh, through this experience of vomiting repeatedly uh, for a day, the stimulus of the egg, which had previously been an enjoyable stimulus, was now a negative stimulus after being reinforced by the vomiting. Now, this is a pretty normal story, and there are a lot of people out there who have probably had similar experiences where they've eaten or ingested some sort of food or liquid and then vomited rather violently, and suddenly that food or liquid is now paired with that experience of being sick, and the two seem to come together, and so waves of nausea might over overwhelm a person when they're eating. What we call that is classical conditioning. Th that was actually developed by this guy, Ivan Petrovic Pavlov. Now we're probably very familiar with the concept of Pavlov. In fact, we're more familiar with his concept of Pavlov's dogs. Now I don't believe it was necessarily dogs he worked with earlier. However, 
it was one of the animals that he was working with. And one of the things he discovered is that when he walked down to present the animals with their food, the dogs enjoyed their food and they start salivating as they ate. Over time though, when he would walk down and hand the dogs their food, they would start to salivate before they got the food. And he realized that the animals were salivating in expectation in the same way that they would salivate when they were eating. Over time, he actually came to realize that the dog started salivating just at the sound of his footsteps. Eventually, he wondered if he could pair a neutral stimulus with this other stimulus by repetition to see if he could create the same stimulus of the dog salivating with a traditionally neutral stimulus. In this case, he chose bells. So he would ring a bell before the dog would eat and the ringing of the bell was enough to get the dog salivating. This is what we call classical conditioning. Now you can almost start to see out of this some level of reward, punishment, that sort of thing, and how that can you can reward players to do certain things and get, uh, get them to behave in certain ways. However, it actually gets far more involved than that. And that's because of this guy, B.F. Skinner. Now, working off of Pavlov and off of another theorist, Thorndike, who we're not going to go into here, he actually begins to think that he can control and manipulate decision-making on the basis of a similar process. What he develops is a process called operant conditioning, where he actually thinks that he can take decision-makers like you and I and change the way we make decisions utilizing stimulus. Now he became famous for this thing here called the operant conditioning chamber, or what we sometimes refer to as the Skinner box, in which the rat pushes a button, receives a reward, and reinforces the behavior. And so the rat knows to push the button to get a pellet of food, no problem. But B.F. Skinner took his research even further and started to elaborate and discovered four main quadrants. Namely, he talked about decreasing behavior through punishment, either by adding something or taking something away, or increasing behavior through reinforcement by adding something or taking away. So this became known as positive punishments, negative punishments where positive and negative referred to the adding or subtracting of something and positive and negative reinforcements for the same reason, where you're adding a reinforcement or you're taking a reinforcement away. Let's see how that operates. In the Skinner box, it might be something as simple as rat hits button, rat receives reward. That's a positive reinforcement. The rat is receiving something, it's gaining something, it's getting something for its behavior and it increases that behavior. What if Th though the rat was receiving a mild electric shock, which he actually did. I don't think we can get away with that today, but provided a mild electric shock to the base of the, the Skinner box. And when the rat hit the button, the electric shock was removed. Well, that's taking something away. And now that's a negative reinforcement. The behavior of the rat is reinforced. It's gained that behavior of hitting the button because it's trying to remove that problem. Let's say the rat hits the button, gets the pellet, but hits the button again and receives a mild electric shock. So now you're starting to control how many times the rat is hitting the button on the basis of providing a punishment should it hit the button too many times. That was a positive punishment. Now we can do a negative punishment by saying it hits the button, it receives the pellet, and if it hits the button again, the pellet disappears. So what we're doing is we're punishing that behavior by taking something away. But we can see this in schools. I'm going to move to an example in which you're probably familiar because a lot of us go to school or have experienced school in some ways and schools are where these ideas get played out quite a lot. So in a school situation, let's say that we give, give a child lines for uh, a certain behavior. Now we've provided a punishment to try and stop a behavior. It's a positive punishment. Same with picking up litter. We don't want you to, we don't want you littering so that, so if you do litter, you get caught littering, you have to go and pick up 10 pieces of rubbish or whatever. Well, that's a positive punishment. I'm providing a punishment to stop you from doing a certain behavior. But what is detention then? Well, detention is taking something away, isn't it? You behave in a certain way in class. I provide you with a detention. So I take away your free time at lunch. I take away your freedom to move away around and work autonomously, I've taken that away, it's now a negative punishment. Same with confiscating technology. So let's say you pull out your phone in class, 
I confiscate your phone, I've taken away your technology, it's a negative punishment. However, this is where schools truly excel, and this is the big one here. Sticker charts. I'm providing you something on the basis to reinforce your behavior. It's a positive reinforcement. Same with awards and certificates, and these things are amazing. We dole these out like candy, which is also, in a sense, a positive reinforcement. What about removing something. So let's say that you get all your work done. I take away homework for the night. I say, look, you can, you don't have to do homework tonight. You've worked so hard during class. I've taken something away. I provide a negative reinforcement. I've encouraged that behavior or reinforced that behavior by removing something. What about providing you with free time in class? You've behaved well this week. You've worked really hard. Have a free lesson at the end of the week. I've reinforced that behavior of working hard, working well, communicating well throughout the week by taking away an extra lesson and giving you the chance to have free time. But let's look at this from a video game perspective and start to apply this in different sectors because we are here to talk about video games and then board games. So let's look at it here. When, when characters die in video games, there's a series of things that happen. Firstly, death itself is a positive punishment, whether it's you no longer live, so you've had that taken away, or you lose inventory, that's a negative punishment because we're taking things away. You lose inventory if you die, you lose the ability to progress through the game. How about sporting times in games though, where once you die, there's a certain amount of time you have to wait before your character can spawn and get back into the action. Well, that's providing a time restriction on your ability to spawn in. It's a positive punishment. What about life bars? Well, life bars are taking something away so that you if you get hit, if you allow yourself to get hit, if you fight in such a way that you take blows, then you're losing your life bar. It's a negative punishment. We're taking something away. Now, what about this one here though? This is from Battlefield 1942. One of the things I liked in Battlefield 1942 was when if you were too close to a hand grenade going off, the explosion would cause you, cause you to be disorientated. Uh, you would lose sound. You couldn't see properly. You would get this blurry vision and you couldn't move around the screen properly. What they were doing was they were taking away your ability to move freely. They were taking away your, the freedom of movement as a way of punishing you for being too close to the action or allowing yourself to get caught next to a hand grenade. It's a negative punishment. However, what about the rewards? Well, games are really good at rewards as well. In fact, leveling up has got to be one of the best rewards ever. And leveling up, there's whole things dedicated to how we level up, making sure that the, the level up feels right, that there's the right ching, there's the right noises, there's the right experience points that explode through the roof. They, they spend ages trying to make sure that people, when they level up, get that experience of leveling up. They feel it when they play that, yes, sometimes they even get life back or extra health back. And so they get this positive reinforcement. What about loot crates? Loot crates are providing you with uh, tools, with weapons, with advantages, they're positive reinforcement. And of course, there's this one, which is a bit more meta than because it's not just in the game, it's about playing the game, the achievement unlocked. Just that doo -doo sound, when we hear it, it triggers something in our brains. We love that sound. We love seeing it pop up on our screen. Achievement unlocked. And sometimes for the most innocuous, ridiculous things on the planet. Or even in Duke Nukem, when you get steroids, you can run faster, move, move quicker. You can jump higher. You can shoot more. When we get bonuses like that to our characters, they're providing us something. They're providing us extra things for performing certain actions or doing certain things or finding certain items. So they're positive reinforcements. Now for board games, I chose only one game and that's X-Wing Miniatures, simply because this one game covers all of these areas really well. And let's have a look at some of those. So for instance, when your character is about to fly through an asteroid belt, you have to make a decision because when you fly through an asteroid belt, you have to roll a damage die and you take that damage regardless of shields. Those asteroids are not impacted by your shields. You run the risk of taking a hit or a critical and they are providing a damage or a hit or critical on the basis of performing a certain action. They are a positive punishment. Now let's say on your movement phase, you chose to do a red maneuver. Well, you get the bonus of doing the red maneuver, which is to move further, faster, do a tighter turn, whatever. However, 
you get a stress token. And that stress token means that you can no longer perform certain actions. You cannot perform another red maneuver. You can't use certain weapons and you lose your action for that turn. You don't get to do your bonus action, whatever it is. So what it does is it takes things away for performing that particular action. So it's a negative punishment. Now let's look at the targeting ruler because this specifically provides a nice section across the board where if your opponent is at a distance of three away from you, then they get to roll an extra defense die for being three distance away from you, for being further away from you, which you can shoot. They're getting a bonus. They're getting a positive reinforcement. Now, if they are within one distance of your firing arc, well, then you get the bonus. Now, so this is a positive reinforcement for your flying. Now, let's say you fly with a green action. Well, you get to remove your stress token and you get to prov you get to do certain actions. It's taking away restrictions. So it's a negative reinforcement. Now, before I take this even further, I really want to talk about how the this, this section here is really just about mechanics and design choices that help people learn these games. Now, all these people are doing so far is providing um, bonuses or taking bonuses away or providing punishments or taking punishments away as a way of helping the player learn how to play the game. In this sense, they're really providing you providing you the player with the chance to make choices as well. In some ways, this is really good. Like, yes, you can make a red action. You get bonuses for making a red. You get to do a sharp turn, but you now have to face a restriction or you now get some sort of punishment. And so one of the good things about this is this draws out of the player that sense of risk reward. Do I run the risk of doing this? Uh, or maybe to get that bonus, I have to put myself into peril. So there are it adds to the richness and the depth of the decision making on top of the fact that it actually teaches the player how to play the game. This is a really good thing. Uh, they're really good ways of helping people acclimatize and get into the game and focus on the gameplay and the enjoyment of the gameplay simply through having the mechanics there of rewarding your players or in different ways or punishing your players in different ways so that they le both learn the game and start to have the richness in decision making that they need or that makes for interesting gameplay. Now, this is a really clever use of B.F. Skinner's work and his work on operant conditioning or what what sometimes it's referred to, and what we'll probably refer to it here is behaviorism. Now, there are some designers who take exceptions to these rules, and specifically because these are about the game designer controlling the player, as if that's part of the experience. Now, I want to explore some of those, those different theories and some of that different thinking, simply as a way of us understanding the design process a little bit better. Now, I should say that more specifically, these issues come in a little bit later, and it's not so much about how we play the game, but how these games force us to act in the real world. So we'll get into that and we'll have a little bit of a look. Now, before we get to what I would consider the penultimate Skinner Box styled app, I want to give some sort of credence or at least uh, an acknowledgement to what I would consider the ultimate. Skinner Box app, and that is this one here, Candy Crush. Now, Candy Crush Saga has been around for quite a while and is ingenious in its use of uh, positive and negative uh, reinforcements and positive and negative punishments as a way of building its fan base, as a way of uh, promoting itself, as a way of engaging people in gameplay. It's very cleverly designed. However, I want to focus on one that I think probably has a little bit more attention at the moment, and that's this one here. Pokemon Go. Now, Pokemon Go has boomed across, and I've spoken about it regularly on Nerds of Wisdom, but here I want to look at some of its design elements and maybe see how some of these elements are even flowing into the board game industry and see what some designers are actually criticizing these games for. Now, if you want to look at negative punishments for uh, Pokemon Go, well, we know outright that any banning of accounts for uh, false accounts or utilizing certain apps that allow you to transport anywhere around the world is a negative punishment because it's taking away something as a form of punishment, which in this case is the entire app 
or your, your account entirely. However, there's also uh, punishments in terms of battling in gyms. If you're if you go into a gym and you're unprepared or your characters aren't up to scratch, you, you lose life points, hit points, your characters get weak and get knocked out. And so you have to utilize your resources to revive them. The game doesn't do that for you. So although you've spent that time going around and collecting these items and collecting these things, you must utilize your resources to pay for it. In some senses, that's a negative punishment as well because they're forcing you to take things away as a way of punishing you for engaging in uh, fights beyond your, your capability. But there are positive punishments as well, such as going around to the poker stops. And when you spin a poker stop, it turns purple. So you can't spit, you can spit on it, but it gets nothing. It just says you need to come back later. And for five minutes, it has a cooldown period until it turns blue and you can spin it again. It's taking something away as a punishment. It's a negative punishment. Of course, also when you spin a Pokestop and you discover this sign here saying your bag is full, your ability to collect items has been taken away. And so it's a negative punishment. Now the game I wouldn't say utilizes a lot in terms of positive punishments. And I'm open to discussion on some of these even uh, as they sometimes might blur the line. However, I'd say that the positive punishments tend to be limited or restricted. And I think that's an intentional design choice because actually punishing someone is a really harsh thing to do, especially when you want people to be making different choices and going on. Sometimes I think that might lead to people switching off from a game. However, as I said, I'm totally open to discussion on some of these points as they're not always necessarily clear either way. However, let's get into having a look at some of the reinforcements that it uses. And clearly, the spinning the poker stops has got to be one of the big ones. You go around, you spin the poker stop. Not only do you get the pleasure of spinning the poker stop, but out come bubbles. And you don't even need to hit these bubbles to make them burst. You can just hit the X and go out and get all the reward. But you can sit there and hit all the bubbles. And we love hitting the bubbles. And it's this very pleasurable uh, tactile thing to do where we chase the bubbles and hit them. We don't need to do it but we do it and our brains love us for it. Now, additionally, like in any game, there are medals, there are ways of leveling up, there are bonuses you can get. So these medals are providing something as a way of reinforcing behavior. Now, I don't want just the bronze medal, I want the gold medal, so I'm going to keep collecting that particular uh, type of Pokemon or whatever the medal is trying to encourage. It's a positive reinforcement. So look at these, the berries and the Ultra Balls and the Great Balls, they take away restrictions on our gameplay. They provide us with the ability to to catch greater Pokemon without having to throw as many extra balls or uh, having to throw them as many times. So they're a negative reinforcement. But this is where some people really have issue with these games. And it's not just in those parts of the gameplay, it's more with these parts here. Because I haven't mentioned the lures, I haven't mentioned the incense, and I haven't mentioned the lucky eggs. Now, where would they fit into it? Well, lures provide uh, more Pokemon to the general group, so they're positive reinforcement. Incense does the same thing for an individual, it's a positive reinforcement. Lucky Eggs provide us extra XP, so they're a positive reinforcement. But they're also linked somewhat to this here. Now, this is where Pokemon makes its money. And this is where some game designers have actually started taking issue with these types of games. So what happens is games make these positive reinforcements available initially and at different times keep coaxing us in with how good they are by giving us experiences of them, but they limit the number that are there. So we have to go and actually purchase them if we want more. There's nothing specifically I can do to shorten the amount of time between getting a new lure or a new egg. I just have to keep playing. However, I can do that by purchasing them. Let's say I've caught too many Pokemon and now I need to get rid of some. Instead of cleaning out Pokemon or sending them off to the professor, I can just upgrade my Pokedex. Or it, let's say my bag is full. Instead of ditching items, which would be unpleasant, I can just upgrade my bag. Oh, this is perfectly well and fine, but these are linked to financial costs. Now, I could wait until I get the golds from poker gyms, but A, I have to be at that level to compete in poker gyms, and B, I have to be doing it on such a level that I'm capable of getting those gyms for long enough. Now, what we won't go into is the actual systems of how the money is structured to coax us to continue buying more because they always leave us with just a little bit left over. What some game designers raise as a particular issue is that these games are intentionally putting our brains in a state of distress so that we would want to alleviate this distress 
to get greater bonuses and to keep that stimulation going. And so we're willing to pay the $1.50 or the $7 or the $50. And we're willing to pay more and more money so that we can alleviate the stress of not having those bonuses or alleviate the stress of the frustration of having to walk around and to collect things slowly. And we can expedite the process. We can expedite the enjoyment of the game simply by paying a little more. Now, some designers think this is perfectly fine. Nolan Bushnell, co-founder of Atari, states that stated that these games, these pay-as-you-go or micro-purchase games are a more honest form of gameplay because not only do you get a sense of the game, you get to experience the gameplay unfettered and you get to say, hey, look, this is the game and what it's like. And if you want to play it, then you just have to pay a little more. And he said, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, he argues that in some senses, instead of paying for a game outright, we can pay, play as much as we want and pay for as much as we want. But this isn't what everyone is arguing. Now, one of the things I do want to cover is the whole concept of catching Pokemon, because catching Pokemon is this randomized event. You actually don't know when or where it's going to happen. And it might happen more, it might happen less. You might get a good one, you might get a bad one. It doesn't really indicate, there's no indication, no way of determining your success level in that, except through the lures, except through the incense, and even then you can't guarantee the quality of the Pokemon you get. I once used an incense and got nothing but Rattatats for half an hour, and wasn't that fantastic? Thank you, Pokemon. Now, the idea of randomizing what you get out of the gameplay is somewhat of an interesting condition. One of the things that BF Skinner did in his Skinner boxes is that he randomized the reinforcement reward. So the pellet would come out random events. So it could be 20 hits, it could be 15 hits. And what he discovered is this created an almost compulsive behavior with the rat, that the rat was more willing to go up and hit the button. We can now attribute this to something in our own worlds that we're probably familiar with, such as this little machine here. Now, in an essence, poker machines are just Skinner boxes designed to coax us to give more money. And they work. They really work. And we know they work. We know the revenues that they make and how they generate huge funds and income. However, for some designers, it raises moral issues because what it means is that we're not actually engaging players for the sake of the gameplay. We're not engaging players with the game itself. We're creating systems and tricks to stimulate the brain. And what happens is we start to find players will play games for far longer, even beyond the point of boredom, because when they click the button and they do discover that reward, it triggers something in their brain. Game designers are starting to question whether it's actually morally responsible to have systems within their games that get people to continue playing the game long beyond they desire to play the game long beyond their interest in the game, but simply because we've found a way to stimulate their brain compulsively. Some designers would say that that's a problem. I don't want to stretch this analogy too far, but some of these micro purchases could be seen in board games through such things as expansions. You get part of the game, but not the whole game. And so you get to buy as you go. Or trading card games, collectible games. What about time stories? A game where you get one hour for $80 and then you get to get an extra hour for $40 or $50 after that. Isn't that the same thing? Kickstarter has this covered as well with stretch goals and all that sort of thing. It knows well and truly how to get people to continue to contribute money. Now I'm gonna leave this here and we're gonna call this the first part of this discussion. We've already started to get into the morals and ethics and we're gonna explore that a little bit more later. But we're also gonna try and end with how video games and board games can help each other in the design process. And that's really where I wanna go is that this should really be about us thinking, being thinking designers. And I really wanna be a thoughtful designer. now. Do I totally agree with the people who are against micro purchases? Well, no, I love Pokemon Go. I love video games. I love all the way it triggers my brain. I enjoy it, I have fun. Does that mean that there's more out there? Perhaps, can we create games with more out there? I think so. And we're gonna look at some of that in our next episode. With that said, thank you for watching this first part. Please follow the links to the second part and we'll get straight into it. Now, before I go, if you like what we're doing, please hit that like button. If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Dave Adams, and you've been watching The Core Mechanic. <laughs>